Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, my name's Anne. I'm a kids lung doctor and I work at the University of Alberta. And I really appreciate being invited tonight. And I also really appreciate that you guys are getting together and supporting each other with your asthma. I think that's fantastic. And I'm guessing that a ton of my patients are gonna be joining you at some point. Um, so I wanted to talk about asthma a little bit because one of the things that I've discovered over time is that when my patients really understand how their asthma works and how their medicines work, they're able to set their goals and tell me what they want. And then we work together as a team to achieve those goals. That seems to be the most effective way that I've seen for getting asthma under control. So I'm hoping that we'll have a conversation tonight. And I, my um, trainees especially will tell you I can be kind of yappy, but I hope that there's lots of time for everybody to talk. And we can all walk away understanding how asthma and the different treatments work and feeling like it's okay to choose and feeling confident in choosing different asthma treatments based on your asthma severity, how you, your asthma responds, and what the side effects are that you're willing to or um, able to live with. And find ways to support people with asthma so that everyone can live their best life because everyone deserves to. And um, advocate for people with asthma, which you are already doing by being in this group. So one of the things we do in medicine a lot is something called case-based learning. And I find actually it's easier to think about different concepts when you think about the people that are involved. So we'll be kind of working our way through different cases. These are, none of these are real people. I made them up. <laughs> and I've certainly seen presentations like this. So I wanted to start with three children. One of them is quite a new baby, born at term, pretty healthy, but has had two colds thanks to the older sibling in daycare and um, gets wheezy with the colds. And so the question is, well, do they have asthma? They're otherwise completely well. The second one is probably the sibling, three years old, attends daycare, gets wheezy with colds, but when they're well, they cough about five nights a week. And they have an older sister. They borrowed a puffer that that one had for exercise. And it slowed down the cough a little bit, long enough to fall asleep, but not to stay asleep overnight. And the third one are twins. They're pretty athletic. Um, they had the same kind of wheeze with colds when they were little, but not anymore. But now they're getting a bit out of breath with activity and didn't make provincials this year, which was pretty disappointing. One of them thinks the puffer helps. One of them doesn't. So what is asthma? And what does controlling asthma mean and why would we try that? Um, we'll look at treatment strategies and how those treatments work and put it all together. So I'm gonna introduce this to you the way, I, I want you to think about it the way your doctor thinks about it because then it makes a lot more sense when you're having those conversations about your medications and your symptoms. So we diagnose asthma if first of all, you have to have symptoms of asthma and they have to be intermittent or on and off. So not all the time, every single day. There's no other cause that could explain it, like a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis or something like that. And you need to be over one. And that's typically because kids, when they're very young, babies will get um, wheezed with colds sometimes because the inflammation in their lungs and the airways are so tiny that they get wheezy just from the cold, which is a completely different process than asthma and doesn't respond to the same medications. So if you respond to asthma medication, it's probably asthma. Or if you have this reversible obstruction on spirometry. So what is that? Well, spirometry is that lung function test that many of you may have done or watched somebody else do. And this is just a diagram of what the breathing looks like. It's a little bit of a graph. So on this vertical axis is air speed. And this line down the middle is zero. So you start here. And if you've done spirometry, you'll know there's a big breath in. And so as you take your breath in, your airspeed gets bigger in the negative direction because you're pulling your out of the machine until your lungs start to fill up. And then when your lungs are totally as full as you can get them and you feel like you're about to float away, your airspeed goes down to zero because there's no room. And then we say, blast it out. And the reason we do that is because as you empty your lungs, we can measure how fast the air goes. And if the airway is narrow from asthma, it will go less quickly. So if there's no asthma, your lungs empty out beautifully and the airflow slows down as you run out of air. 
if there is asthma, it is really hard to push air out past those little narrowed airways. And so that breath out gets prolonged. It slows down quickly and then it just goes on and on and on forever. And some of you may have blown out for like, it feels like you're inside out by the time you're done. So then we give you a reliever medication. And if your um, lung function normalizes, then that's a diagnosis of asthma. So when I say, what are your lungs blocked with asthma? What I mean is this picture of the airway. Everyone draws a picture of an airway and everyone looks at me when I hand them the fake plastic airways. And they're like, why are you giving me garden hose? But it's because asthma is not a disease of your lung tissue. It's a disease of those very small airways. What happens with a normal airway is you have air and then a layer of um, tissue and then muscles around that. And so that looks pretty healthy. If I was to look in with a camera, it would look a lot like the inside of a garden hose. However, when you have asthma and there's inflammation present, those tissues get really swollen and kind of boggy. They almost look gray instead of healthy pink when you look at them with a camera. There's extra mucus production. And then when you have an asthma attack or an exacerbation, the muscles get tight and scrunch that down. And so it's very hard for air to pass through. And air passing through a narrowed passage makes a wheeze sound because um, you know it's, it's kind of like how when you blow through a flute, you can make different noises except way less musical. And you can have a lot of different symptoms which you've probably all experienced with your asthma. So out of our three kids, who has asthma? Well, our baby friend is less than a year old, so they don't meet criteria, but it's a little bit bothersome that they're doing all that wheezing. So we'll keep a close eye on them and make up our minds a bit later. Now this little guy definitely has asthma. They're over one, they have these intermittent symptoms, they respond to medication over and over again. So that's very consistent with the diagnosis of asthma. What about the twins? Well, they're over one. They have intermittent symptoms and known triggers. Maybe they respond to medicine, maybe not. But they're big kids. They can test. So let's do the test. Twin A did the test. And before the reliever or bronchodilator, she had airflow obstruction. And it went away when we gave her a bronchodilator. So she meets the criteria for the diagnosis. Twin B didn't have that. Everything looked normal both. And she didn't respond to that reliever. And she's like, I'm the one that it doesn't work for. So this is not consistent with the diagnosis of asthma. Sorry, twins, you're not identical. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is asthma control. So why do we care about asthma control? We'll talk about that. And also what exactly is well-controlled asthma compared to uncontrolled asthma? So we'll talk about that as well. This is my big dog, Strider. He's not named after Strider the airway sound that you get with croup. He's named after Aragorn from Lord of the Rings because my daughter kind of likes that. But um, anyway, he's uh, very controlling. So we, um, when we wrote the Canadian guidelines, the Canadian Thoracic Society, in, re in reviewing the literature and looking at everyone else's guidelines in Europe and America and things like that, we said, well, what is good asthma control? And the question really is, how many bad days a week are we willing to accept, right? So you can have symptoms or need a reliever up to twice a week in the daytime, but less than once a week at night to have good asthma control. And that includes for exercise. So if you're using your reliever before exercise because you actually need it, not just because someone told you to and you randomly do it and you're not sure, well, that's not okay. Your exacerbations should be mild. So for sure, if you get sick or go to a campfire or something like that, and you have asthma symptoms, you just need to use your reliever. You don't need any oral steroid or injected steroid. You don't need to go to the eMERGE or get hospitalized. And your quality of life is good. So you're not missing work or school. Sorry for people that like to miss work or school, but not considered good quality of life. Okay, so that is good asthma control. So one of our little friends is six and they have a diagnosis of asthma. They miss between one and five days a month of school because they catch colds all the time because they're going to school. And they cough once a week at night. They're really breathless in soccer and hockey. So, you know, they're, they're the goalie. They can't do the power skate. Um, they have a lot of trouble playing forward in soccer as well. When they go to their auntie's house, the cats set off their asthma, but that's not that often. And they love swimming and swimming doesn't bug them that much, but they're not the fastest swimmer in the pool. 
And they use a reliever every time they do an activity just because they know that it's going to go poorly. So that's our other dog. His name is Peregrine Took, Pip. He's a puppy in spite of being very big. And he walks on his face for some reason. Like, like he is a totally out of control person. So um, yeah, is this child in control? No, this child's about as well controlled as Pip. So quality of life is not there, I'm missing way too much school. They cough too much. They have too many sports symptoms. I don't know how often they go to auntie's house if it's once a year, maybe we'll accept that. And they do relieve with just salbutamol with their reliever, they're not needing an oral steroid. And the swimming looks okay, but the soccer outweighs it. And they um, are not passing from other exposures as well. So this child is out of control. So why is uncontrolled asthma bad for us? Well, on a day-to-day -day basis, people whose asthma is out of control are losing out on feeling healthy, on sleeping okay, participating at school or work, and achieving, like, like being the best, their best self. It's hard to participate in sports. I, I've met kids who were excluded from birthday parties because they cough and coughing is dirty. And people have to go through asthma attacks, which are frankly terrifying for people. And they spend lots and lots of time in our emergency room, which although we do our best to keep it charming, is not really a high quality way to spend eight hours of your day. And sometimes even have to get hospitalized. It really others people at times. So if your asthma is impacting you, um, you often feel left out. And one of my patients in kindergarten once said, I hate school because everyone goes outside and plays and I can only watch through the window and everyone hates me. And how terrible is that, right? I'm thrilled to say that as an older child, their asthma is incredibly well controlled and they're making sports teams unhappy as anything. So that's where we wanna see people get to, right? On top of that, if your lungs are inflamed all the time, you're at an increased risk of developing lung disease as an adult. So it's really important that we help kids get control for so many reasons. So who's at risk of an asthma attack? Yes, he's a very tall puppy. Well, I thought we'd think about three kids again. And being a kid doctor, I talk about kids all the time, but I know that adults are out there too and they will have similar symptoms. So our 14 year old friend um, has a diagnosis of exercise induced asthma because they did some testing and we found it, but they're well controlled. They're not having asthma attacks. Um, they do their sports without any difficulty. They don't have allergies, pets, smoke exposure or any other risk factors. Our seven-year-old friend has asthma symptoms every time they undertake sports and they love sports, so they're always coughing. And they do have a Mr. Kitty at home and Mr. Kitty unfortunately has some bad habits that include smoking inside the house. Um, not a cat person, allergic myself. And um, she has been to hospital a few times, um, many uh, eMERGE visits, a few hospitalizations. Um, and then our three-year-old has well-controlled viral wheeze, no severe attacks, some significant allergies, including anaphylaxis to nuts, as well as environmental allergies to things like pollen, and has a Miss Puppy in the house, but Miss Puppy doesn't smoke, thank goodness, and has never had a severe exacerbation. So we break down risk by age, um, because there's different risks depending on your age. So a risk of having a mild exacerbation, so needing your reliever puffer, but not needing to go to eMERGE or get steroids or anything, if you're under six, allergy is a bigger risk, but also being um, younger, being a boy um, and being underweight. And income impacts people's asthma for sure. Income impacts people's health in general. Um, people in that elementary age group are mainly um, triggered by, um, so exposure to um, smoke, especially indoor environmental tobacco smoke. Um, and then, People age 12 plus smoking themselves, previously smoking um, or the tobacco smoke exposure are the big players in that game. For moderate exacerbations, needing to use your reliever frequently. So that makes sense, right? Your asthma is not well controlled. You're more likely to have another exacerbation, but allergic people as well. And again, um, smoking. And in the severe exacerbations, the main risk is a previous severe exacerbation. So we know that if you've had one, we've got to work harder with you to help you avoid those. So who is at risk? Well, our 14-year-old is really minimal risk of any attacks. Our seven-year-old is 
had a lot of severe exacerbations. She's at risk of more severe exacerbations and she's a pretty high risk kid until we help her get control. And the three-year-old has a mild risk. So my kids let me know I should put this slide in just to let you know that the next slide is upsetting. Um, it upsets me actually. Um, it makes me want to cry every time I look at it. But this is something that people fear. And while a few parents bring their children out into the limelight and bring them to the media for reasons of advocacy, um, many of our parents don't actually share and many of our kids don't share their truly terrifying experiences with asthma and with feeling like they can't breathe. Both of these children passed away at the age of nine, both from various forms of air pollution but 10 years apart on two different continents. And both of, in both cases, their parents have actually already made a big difference for other people with asthma and for all children to protect them from poor air quality and also to help people understand the importance of asthma. So I think it's really important to put the worry on the table and then remove that by helping people gain good control of their asthma and making sure that they're comfortable to speak out. Um, one of my patients, um, when they were younger at school, their friends became aware of their asthma on purpose because they're a good self-advocate and their friends would check in on them and make sure they're okay when they're playing. So you have the other people looking out for you and you have a good advocacy group working with you. So we need to speak up for people with asthma. We need to have empathy for people. It's an invisible disability. We need to protect people. We need to decrease the harm they experience. And we need to make sure that everybody is included equally. So that involves making sure that people have good control and that we're speaking out and helping them avoid their triggers. There are limitations, right? So the needs of the majority, like does everybody have to play indoors because one person needs to? Maybe not, but we can find a balanced way of controlling things like wildfire smoke exposure. People are sometimes judged and obviously resources because asthma therapies are really expensive. Driving to see the doctor and parking where I work is really expensive. So those are things that we need to think about and get support for people. So how do we treat it? Well, there's a lot of medications. And one of the things that I've heard from people bothers them a lot is, well, I get this one size fits all approach. And that is really frustrating because as everyone knows, your own asthma, because there's so many different ways that we can get to inflammation in the lungs, is going to be a little bit different than everyone else's. I often think of it like glasses. So I'm wearing glasses. My husband also has glasses. But man, if I put on the wrong glasses, I can't see anything. His bend things, so I like walk into walls. So it's really important that we pick the things that work for each person very carefully. However, it's an incredibly common condition. More than one in 10 people in Canada will have had a diagnosis of asthma at some point in their lifetime. So that's really common. It means that there's a lot of evidence. We've tried out a lot of medications. There is a huge evidence base. So we're able to establish guidelines with really good knowledge and we're able to understand our commonly used therapies and how they work well. So we have this block by block basic approach to care. But then once we do that approach, we have to do the care appropriately, right? So then we tailored the care to you based on your response. And so that's where the consumerism part comes in. You, if you're an educated shopper, you're going to say this medicine works, this medicine doesn't work, I hate those side effects. And that's how we will help you get control of your asthma in a way that's really approachable. So if you go to the um, site that I've sent you to here with the QR code, um, you'll see our asthma management guidelines. And this picture is everywhere. It's like this big triangle, but basically you start by saying, well, is it asthma? Let's control your triggers. Let's give you a reliever. And then let's walk you up from a low dose inhaled steroid, which is kind of the baseline of our control. And so we'll break that down a little bit. And he doesn't sleep on the bed, actually. He doesn't like climbing stairs. So he, he just sleeps on the floor, which is very, very helpful. But I don't think that's a me... I'm a good dog parent thing. I think that's a me, I'm a lucky dog parent thing. But we need to um, avoid triggers like smoke, allergens, and damp and mold. We can make changes. We can clean our furnace filters and use air cleaners. We can ask people to please smoke outside. And when the trees are smoking outside for wildfire smoke and things, we can stay indoors. We can also immunize against immunization preventable or vaccine preventable respiratory diseases. 
most people are used to their reliever. Um, the it's called a beta two agonist. So that's a kind of drug that impacts the muscles in your airway walls and also the heart muscle. Um, and so that will explain some of your side effects as well as some of the good effects. So it'll relax your airway muscle and open your airway somewhat so that you can breathe more easily, but it doesn't change the amount of inflammation there. So when the, the blue puffer gets used, you're still inflamed, but you're open. So it helps you out, but it can also mask some of that inflammation for a while. It'll give you a fast heart rate, make you jittery and hyperactive. And if you get a lot of it, like 20 puffs and then 20 more puffs or something like that, it can affect your heart rhythm. So if you're needing a lot of this inhaler because of an asthma attack, you need to get checked out at the hospital as much for checking your heart rhythm as anything else. It's also controlled by the World Anti-Doping Agency, and some of our long-acting beta agonists are banned by the World Anti-Doping Agency. That doesn't mean you can't go to the Olympics if you have asthma, but it means that I've got a lot of paperwork to do if you're going to the Olympics with your asthma. So if you're in one of those world-class competitive or even um, national-level competitive groups, make sure that you talk to your doctor earlier than later because it takes a while to get the tests and the paperwork in order. So. Our reliever is a fast-acting bronchodilator. They're often blue. Um, salbutamol, salmeterol, and tributylene are the common, um, I'm using the generic names, not the brand names, but they last up to about four hours. They start working really fast. They're at their best about two minutes in. Um, one of your fast-acting guys lasts up to 12 hours, but are these three only last two to four hours. And so when you feel like it wears off, it's because it wears off. So that makes sense. And that's actually a good fit with your diagnosis. Long acting bronchodilators come in two flavors. Salmeterol takes about 30 minutes to work. So it's not used as a reliever. For motorol, which comes in a combination inhaler with budesonide, can be used as a reliever as well as a controller. And it peaks again in a couple of minutes, it starts on in 30 seconds. Both of them last most of the day. And so often your doctor will say, well, you need to take your puffer twice a day. This is why. What happens if you get too much reliever without any inhaled steroid? Well, you end up in this vicious cycle where you're hiding that swelling and inflammation. So you can actually have more exacerbations than somebody who treats the underlying inflammation. Um, you can increase your allergic response. So imagine if I'm going out to mow the lawn and I'm allergic to grass pollen, I take a big puff of something that opens my lungs up and whoof, the grass pollen bumps right in there. And it can increase the allergic messengers that are traveling through your body. And it can also decrease your reliever response. And if you think about me telling my kids off, they block their ears. The receptors on our lungs that listen to our reliever also will block themselves off a little bit after you take it all the time. And so then your lung muscles are a little tighter and they're a little less reactive to your controller. Sometimes people are told, take your reliever before your controller to open your lungs. It doesn't really do it. If you're using your controller effectively and the way it, by direction, it'll get in where you need it to. There's a couple of exceptions, but um, like if you have a dry powder inhaler and you can't take a deep breath because your lungs are feeling tight, but then we just prescribe you an inhaler that works appropriately for your body. We don't want to normalize that daily reliever because then again, you're going to get used to it and it's not going to work as well. And it increases your risk of exacerbation because of that. And that brings me to our controller. So these are the mainstay of asthma therapy. Back when we first discovered that steroids controlled asthma, people gave systemic steroid and people had all kinds of wild side effects. It was terrible. But then we figured out how to do a puffer where we can mostly put that steroid just on the surface of your lungs, like using eczema cream on your skin. And we hope that most of it doesn't soak in. So they increase the recycling of your inflammatory cells. If they're getting broken down, they're not around making trouble. And it increases your sensitivity to your reliever. So it makes your reliever work better. So bonus, um, it decreases the inflammatory messengers that are traveling around in your lungs and it blocks mucus secretion. So overall, this helps make your asthma better. They take two to four weeks to start to work. If you use it really regularly, and I mean like six days a week because I'm human and I miss stuff too. Um, then after about a month, you know what you're going to get out of your inhaler and its dose. Everyone worries about side effects. There's no such thing as a drug without side effects. When I prescribe oxygen, oxygen has side effects. 
So, and we breathe that every day on purpose. So I think it's important to talk about them. What parents worry the most about when they talk to me is whether um, their kids are gonna reach adult height. And there is a little bit of loss of adult height ranging from a couple of millimeters to up to a centimeter for people that use long-term inhaled steroids. But it's a trade-off between that and making sure that people can breathe. So the thing that I worry the most about is something called adrenal insufficiency. Our body makes steroid hormones and the steroid hormone called cortisol is the one that helps us feel awake when we get up in the morning. It gives us our energy. And if you get really sick, it helps you fight off that illness. You need a big rush of cortisol to push the illness away. When we give our body a high dose of steroid internally, the body says, oh, thanks for making that. Now I don't have to. And so it's not primed and ready to go anymore. And so then when you do get break your arm or get really sick or something like that, you may not be able to fight it off as well. So we definitely worry about that. That typically does not occur until you're at a high dose or higher than the maximum prescribed dose of inhaled steroid. However, if you're on a high dose inhaled steroid and you're also on a systemic steroid or you frequently have asthma attacks and need a systemic steroid, that increases your risk. We can help you replace that cortisol until your body starts making it again. And that is a major goal for people that are having to use high steroids because of their severe asthma. You can get yeast growth in your mouth um, and voice changes. And for especially for kids who use the um, spacers with the mask, um, sometimes that can irritate your face and sometimes steroid cream can even make it worse. And your doctor can use other creams to get rid of it. But just wiping your mouth with a cloth can help control that. Some people are told to double their steroid for trouble. So when you feel like a tax coming on or something, double up your steroid is the question. There's no real evidence of benefit. And remember, it takes two to four weeks for that new dose to work. So unless your virus is mailing you a postcard saying, oh, hey, I'm dropping in in a couple of weeks, you're not really going to get the effect that you want. But for kids, and there was a study in Australia before COVID that showed that daycare kids got 14 to 16 separate viruses per winter season. That is a lot of two-week periods for doubling for trouble. That is like all the time. So it's better to just choose the dose that controls the asthma and stick with it. Now for adults who have a bad asthma attack, if you go to four to five times your steroid inhaler, then it gives you basically a systemic steroid dose. So that's like showing up in the emergency and saying, hey, can I have some dexamethasone or prednisone, please? It might limit the number of times you have to drive to the eMERGE because you're getting it at home. And there's limited evidence for harm in a full grown adult that has colds fewer times a year than a kid. So we do say that that's okay. Children who are having an asthma attack, again, there's an increased risk of harm from side effects from the steroids. So I did sort of say, well, most people, the puffer gets in the body just right. But we always have to think about, well, how are we delivering it? Because it's easy enough to swallow a pill, but when you're trying to use a puffer, there's some technical skills involved. And so we do use this metered dose inhaler quite often. That's our little L-shaped puffer. Um, now there is a discussion around climate change and metered dose inhalers because they do have um, uh, chlorinated um, hydrocarbons that can destroy the ozone layer, but a person's got to live with their asthma. So people who can use a dry powder inhaler will sometimes um, make that choice, but you have to be able to generate 30 liters per minute of breath, which is a huge puff in is a dry powder inhaler. So somebody with a very tight chest from asthma is going to really struggle to do that. Now, our metered dose inhalers give you about 10% of your medicine. If you have absolutely fabulous technique, like technique, um, with, but with the spacer device, doesn't matter the brand, you can get 60 to 80% of that medication in your lungs. If the mask on your child, who sometimes honestly isn't going to sit still for this because little kids often hate it, um, but with a poor seal, you don't get much in. With a good seal, you get more in. So it's actually really important to focus on delivery. And like I said, dry powder inhaler is a little better for the environment, a little harder to inhale, fits in your pocket without a spacer. So there's, these are considerations when we're prescribing your medicine. What about other medications? Well, our leukotriene receptor antagonists, um, so that would be um, Montelukast or Zarfalukast are common ones, and in kids, Montelukast. Um, what it does is it stops some of our 
allergy white blood cells from turning on some of our other cells. So it says, hey, muscles don't get tight, stop it. Airway lining, stop being inflamed. And hey, stop making mucus too, bad plan, bad plan. So it just puts the nope on that. And it does it through one of three different pathways. So it decreases asthma. And interestingly, in little kids, and the studies were mostly in preschoolers, it can decrease asthma with viruses as well as with allergies, even though it's an allergy pill. It's a chewable pill in kids. Um, it tastes like, like not very good quality candy. Nothing you'd pay for, but you'd eat it if it was available. And it does have side effects of stomach ache and headache. So we say, hey, take it at night. You'll sleep through that. But if it disturbs your sleep and it's working really well, you can flip it to morning. It works in about four out of five people. And it's a great drug when it works. The mood side effects, these other side effects go away. Mood side effects don't really go away over time. So don't hold out and keep taking it just in case. If you have anxiety, depression, self-harm. And then there's a black box warning on this medication that came out in 2019 for suicidality and completed suicides. So if you are experiencing mood symptoms with that, um, as you're a physician, I would immediately take you off it, even if it impacted your asthma control. We also have alternative bronchodilators like anticholinergics, so ipratropium bromide or um, the longer acting teotropium. They're slow to start to work. They do relax the muscle. So like your reliever, they're not gonna fix the inflammation, but they do help. Um, we don't give these by themselves because there's an increased risk of hiding your true asthma from you until you're really sick. Side effects are dry mouth and urinary retention. And I actually did have a very young patient on teotropium who did experience urinary retention. So it's a thing to think about. They double up, um, they work along the same pathway as some antidepressants. And so you're more likely to see side effects if you're on those meds as well. Antihistamines are amazing. They really push down allergy. They're like Pac-Man, they eat up your histamines, which are one of the major chemical messengers in your body that drive allergic responses. Now, first generation ones like um, um, diphenhydramine are um, very sedating. We may have had those before. Um, they're definitely, you shouldn't do anything that you shouldn't do impaired when you take those. That includes driving or working with heavy machinery or in a job where you have to have focus or concentration. Our second generation ones are the non-sedating antihistamines you can buy over the counter, cetirizine, um, or um, yeah, anyway, um, those ones work really well for a lot of people. And then we have prescription ones as well that are sometimes stronger. Allergy immunotherapy is um, not for respirologists so much. Your allergist can um, give you immunotherapy. They will be able to decide if you're a good candidate for becoming tolerant to some of your allergies. And your asthma does need to be under good control for you to have immunotherapy. So allergists will often send kids to me to get their asthma under control so that Mr. Kitty can stay in the house. Um, yeah. Biologic medications have uh, been out in adult land for a lot longer than in kid land and are really starting to emerge in um, children's therapies. So we've had one um, that fights off anti, it fights IgE, which is an allergy antibody for quite a few years now. We've had another that fights off um, in a couple of interleukins four and 13 that drive the allergy process. And we're getting more now in the 12 plus and starting to have more clinical trials in Canada for other um, ones that fight allergy white blood cells as well. I'm going to say that some of those are already approved in younger kids in other countries, and they're mostly well tolerated. The biggest risk of our biologics is anaphylaxis, which is obviously something we would worry about a lot. So we do watch people the first few times they get it. They can really decrease your asthma symptoms and allow you to get off all of those other meds that have all the side effects. Oral steroids is what we use for exacerbations in a short course. Some people with more severe asthma will be given long-term oral steroids. It also helps fight off um, extra conditions like um, hypersensitivity pneumonitis to mold or birds that people with asthma are prone to. But there is a very high risk of side effects, and that's whether you take it just once in a month with your attacks or regularly. For patients who have had a very severe attack, for every one of my patients who may have been intubated with asthma, I like to give them an extra 
medication. So for people with anaphylactic allergies, you'll be very familiar with your injectable epinephrine. Um, but we can also use that as a bronchodilator in an emergency with asthma. So if you're having a very severe attack and you're using your Ventolin or your, um, uh, your reliever and you're still having symptoms and you're waiting to get help or going and getting help, you can use your um, injectable epinephrine. You definitely need to go to the emergency if you do. A lot of parents come in and they're like, they, they wish it was an asthma or they're seeing things that don't look like asthma. Or um, a lot of kids come in and we really wonder if it is asthma or not. So what are the common things that we see? And I call it a comorbidity if you have asthma plus this other thing. And some of them actually make your asthma worse. So when we control them, your asthma gets better and we can cut down your asthma meds. And sometimes it's just something else entirely. So runny noses and allergies definitely make your asthma worse. Um, heartburn and reflux. You'll ask somebody, oh, do you get barf burps when you're sprinting? And they'll say yes. And then we control the reflux and actually they stop coughing with exercise and they feel great. Vocal cord dysfunction is when your vocal cords don't open all the way when you're trying to exercise. Um, sometimes they can act like deer in the headlights and freeze partly closed. And then it's like you're breathing through a straw you feel in your neck and it's very hard to get air in, whereas asthma is a wheezy disease of hard to get air out. Um, they can trigger each other, but sometimes vocal cord dysfunction acts like asthma. It can be triggered by anxiety or sports or other things. And so there's lots of different things that pretend to be asthma, but they're not. I've had a few patients actually with celiac disease as well. And celiac disease, you think about it as a tummy disease, but it's the whole body. And one of the outside of the gut ways that celiac disease shows up is asthma symptoms. And those patients, once they stop eating wheat, you know, you cut the toast, their asthma is gone because they never really had it. So the important thing, and I think about medication adherence, is that you are choosing the medicine that works for you. So you need medicine that works. We need to share that idea of what works, what doesn't work. And we need to recommend things that are a good fit for you. So you're gonna try stuff, it might work, it might not work, just like the glasses idea, right? And what are problems with the treatment? And when people come back, they're always like, they don't wanna tell me that they didn't use their meds and I'm old, I didn't use it and stuff. But usually that's a me problem. It's not a you problem. It's like I suggested something that doesn't work or something. What if it's hard to use or really side effect you and it makes you feel dreadful or it's expensive? Sometimes people have expectations too. It's like, yeah, I used that thing for three months and then I got sick again when I stopped. It's like, well, I didn't tell you this is a chronic disease, did I? That was my mistake. So we need to have these conversations to make sure that the med works appropriately for patients. Also, like, like when I was going to med school and my little kid had asthma, my five-year-old was better at remembering her puffer than I was in the morning trying to get us out of the house. I put her in charge much better. And sometimes people don't understand. We didn't explain it well. And sometimes it's not asthma. So make sure that you're speaking up when your meds aren't working for you or when you don't like them or when they're hard to afford because it's our job to help you find the stuff that works. And we need to check. We need to check often and think about it. Asthma evolves over your lifetime. It can get better and worse during different periods of your life. It's affected by body changes like pregnancy, work, and different exposures. Moving to another continent can impact people for the better or for worse. So if your control is perfect, we don't need to change anything. If everything has been amazing for so long and you've made it through many illnesses without any asthma attacks, maybe we need to cut things down. And if you're symptomatic and have poor control, maybe we need to move things again. So how are we going to step up, though? What if your control is poor? We start at the low-dose inhaled steroid. We can increase the dose. And when we do studies that show that, we improved our severe exacerbations. So it took longer to get to a time when you had an attack. If we use the same steroid and we add a long-acting bronchodilator, and I made an error on this slide, or a leukotriene receptor antagonist, with the leukotriene receptor antagonist, we get um, no change to severe ex exacerbations, but we got improved day-to-day um, -day symptoms. And with the long-acting bronchodilator, we improved our day-to-day -day symptom control and lung function and mild exacerbations, but we didn't improve severe exacerbations. Um, so the moral of the story is we can increase your steroid dose, but we can also add a different med 
and possibly get a better result without putting you at risk of the side effects. So how do we step down? When do we step down? Well, we should talk every few months. If things are going well, we should try stepping down and stopping. If it doesn't go well, though, it's not like, oh, you did a bad. It's like, oh, that didn't work. And we just go back to the last thing that did work. So I really like this I Can Control Asthma website. They have asthma action plans. I don't love this asthma action plan in particular, but it's a good one. Um, but everybody should have what we should do with your asthma when you're well. How do you control it? How should we use your relievers when you're not well? And when do you call 911? And we should be giving you something in writing that is an action plan. And you should be able to share that with worker school if you need to. I also think the breathing well section on this website is really fantastic. It talks about vocal cord dysfunction and habit cough and all kinds of other things that are really important. So I, I'm a kid doctor, right? And so I see people up until their 18th birthday and then they graduate and I feel wonderful because all these awesome people have grown up into big awesome people and that is amazing. But they're a little bit worried sometimes about the transition part and what they're gonna do. So I thought we'd talk a little bit about the ooh, moving to adult um, and where they go. So we have a 17 year old girl with severe asthma, well controlled on her biologics who is off to a track scholarship at a university in Ontario and has, um, has to go first thing in the summer to do a whole bunch of training camps and things, find a place to live, that good stuff when you move away to university, right? Um, our five-year-old friend is moving to France and they have partially controlled asthma. Um, we're trying to get them into a clinical trial or get them qualified for their biologic medication that we think is gonna help them. And we're really not sure what we're going to do with that person. Like, like how are we going to transition them so that they have asthma control in France? Because my prescription powers do not extend to France. Um, our 16-year-old has many allergies with mild asthma and is planning to attend university in town. They have a family doc. They don't have a pediatrician. And another 16-year-old has very severe asthma on biologics, lots of high-dose medications, just has control and is going to astrophysics, which they don't offer in very many places. So British Columbia or a couple of American sites. So they're like a planner because gosh, if you're good at astrophysics, you're probably a planner. So we got to figure out what to do. So it's really important that we plan transition in advance. I like to plan with families for at least a year before they go, but sometimes, you know, they move to France and you don't have as much time. So you work with what you've got. So you can see what my first thing is in all cases. When children transition to adulthood, co insurance coverage can change. And I know for my kids, I have a 22 year old and, and like every single semester, we have to renew the, yeah, they're still going to school. Gosh, I went to school for like a million years, they are too. So we have to keep it renewed. For this little guy, parents are probably changing jobs completely if they're moving to France. And so their insurance coverage and what they have to pay for may be changing as well. And for these other people, especially if you're moving to the US, we need to make sure that they have good coverage for their asthma. And some insurance plans, if you're buying into your own plan as an adult, won't consider pre-existing conditions. So it's something that you really got to plan ahead for. I am not good at insurance. I'm just good at telling you to get insurance. Um, so, for our child who's going to Ontario, they're going to be out there all the time with that track. So we're going to refer them to an adult pulmonologist. They've got to figure out their own family physician or keep their family physician in Alberta if that's possible. And we can help them with their transition. For this little kid, we have to figure out, do they need a pediatrician, a pulmonologist, or both? Because often a pediatrician will have somebody they like to work with. So I'm going to task the family with figuring out what's going on in their neighborhood, and I will write all of the referrals. And I'm going to tell you, it's about an hour to two hours to transition this patient. This patient, it's going to take me a half day of paperwork to transition, even if their parents do all the homework for me. I can't take care of them virtually necessarily because their body is in France and I am not licensed there. I can take care of kids in BC and Northwest Territories, but not Saskatchewan for the same reason. For this patient with mild asthma, we'll send them to an allergist and they, we will transition their asthma care to their family physician 
because they do have the asthma that's very easily managed by a family risk physician. They can keep going to our clinic till transitioned. And for this guy, he can stay with his family physician. He's planning coming home in the summers and working in Alberta anyhow, but we'll discuss where care will be best and we'll make the referrals that they need so that they have the care and support that they need during the year. And so probably refer to a pulmonary or allergist or whoever they need at their selected city. So those transitions can take time. Again, it takes a long time to phone these clinics and make sure that they're gonna accept my patient. I am allowed to continue to care for adults until they have seen their adult physician. So what with everybody's wait list, sometimes I see kids until they're 19 by the time they get to see the adult doc. And I'm licensed for it, which means that you're insured, my insurance covers the care that you receive. So I think it's really important to think about the asthma, control the asthma. You wanna avoid your triggers. You wanna be the person who's in control. Your doctor is there to help you, but pick what works for you. Plan your transitions and make sure that if your asthma is acting up, have an action plan, jump in and treat it right away. You can be the, your advocate. You can control your own asthma by listening to your body and understanding your needs and advocating for your needs. And you can support other people. And when you protect a child with asthma, you're actually protecting all the kids in their daycare because everybody suffers when they breathe in poor air. Okay, so that was the holy smokes. I talked a lot and now it's everyone else's turn. Thanks, Dr. Hicks. I do have a list of questions. Hopefully you can get through them in time. Interesting one to start. I seem to only experience asthma symptoms at night. Would that still be considered asthma? Or yes. Could it be apnea? Um, yeah. Uh, so yes and yes. Um, asthma often shows up at night, sometimes because we're noticing it. But interestingly, some people are um, more symptomatic at night, for sure. So the first thing would be to gain good asthma control. And then you, if you're worried about apnea, sometimes apnea can lead to you kind of coughing when you, if you have an obstructive pause, um, you might cough a little bit as you recover from your airway obstructing. So that would require somebody to assess you um, for that. One of the other things that causes nighttime symptoms is nasal congestion and post-nasal drip and gastroesophageal reflux or heartburn can also cause nighttime symptoms. Mm, okay. Great. I have another question here. Why can't I use inhaled or why can't I use inhaled corticosteroids for long-term relief? But whenever I use a corticosteroid cream, I can only use it for a short time. Otherwise I experience steroid withdrawal and my skin breaks out. Hmm. Yeah. Good question. I don't know the answer to that. Um, I, I mean, for the inhaled corticosteroids, we do use them long term to decrease inflammation. And it is a very low dose. And it's a reasonably measured, dose. like you're breathing it in. So it's not perfectly measured, but it's a reasonably measured dose. And those tiny little microgram doses are very, very small. So that's why it takes them so long to work is that the goal is that very little of it is um, absorbed systemically. My guess would be that when you use the steroid on your skin, especially if you're using it on a larger skin surface, that you may be getting a higher dose of steroids. So we do limit the amount of time that you spend using it. We try and limit the amount of skin that you put it on. Um, and then our skin is really exposed, right? And so say if your hands are sensitive, and I know a lot of people, for instance, whose skin breaks down terribly with all the hospital hand sanitizers. And so as soon as you get that exposure again, your skin will get damaged again. But that's, I guess, more than me actually knowing the answer to that question. Yeah, that was an interesting one. I'll probably look into that question. Um, okay, we've got a third question here. What is the difference between my regular medication and a biologic? Are there pros and cons? Yeah, absolutely. So each of our regular medications, like our inhaled steroid, so the inhaled steroid is really the backbone of our asthma therapy. It decreases inflammation. It's mostly topical. So it is like... Um, just landing on your lungs. Now, some of it gets absorbed into your body, but most of it does its job where it lands is the goal of using those low-dose inhaled steroids. 
the biologic medications are actually they're they're leaning into what we call personalized medicine so it's like we'll take a profile of what your allergy white blood cells and your allergy antibodies and things look like and we'll also look at other parts of your body so people can get something called eosinophilic esophagitis which is inflammation of the swallowing tube they can get nasal polyps with allergies um, they can get really terrible eczema and some biologics work really well for eczema. The same one actually that works for eosinophilic esophagitis. There's another one that is like absolutely fantastic for nasal polyps and a different one that's absolutely amazing for hives. So we'll try and look at your body systems and the way your allergic asthma works. And there's one that actually works for non-allergic asthma that's available in age 12 plus as well. Um, and then we try the biologic to shut down those systems. And so it's an antibody that actually gloms onto whatever molecule it targets in your body. And it can take a few days to a few months to actually work if it's going to work for you. But once it starts changing how your immune system works by wiping out some of those messengers, then um, it changes your asthma control. And at that point, you're often able to decrease some of your puffers and pills and things like that. Does that sort of make sense? It looks like they're nodding, so yes. Okay, perfect. Okay. Yeah, so basically it's to modify your immune system instead of to damp down the effects of your immune system acting up. Okay, awesome. I think we've got time for one more question. Let's see here. Okay, they are writing... I'm 28. I had asthma as a child. It seems to be well managed right now to the point where I don't need intervention. Asthma runs in my family. My grandparents had it. Now they have COPD. My child has asthma. Should I expect myself or my child to develop COPD when we're older? What is the relationship between asthma and COPD? Oh, that's a good question. Um, there's a lot of work going into that. Um, yeah, so some people are at higher risk of developing COPD than other people. Um, and part of it is exposures. So uh, things like smoking, for sure, although some people can develop similar disease without. And part of it is around asthma control. So um, some of that data is emerging like it's fairly new. But what we're seeing is that kids who have poorly controlled asthma, so they're having multiple asthma attacks during childhood, have lung function that looks more like COPD when they're adults. It's a bit of a chicken and egg question. We don't know whether those asthma attacks caused them to develop COPD or if they were genetically lined up to have COPD, which also made them genetically set up to have lots of asthma attacks. So we don't know that. But we do work really hard to help control the asthma and avoid asthma attacks in the hopes that that prevents or decreases the severity of COPD in an older person. But there is definitely a relationship where people with asthma um, may have more COPD symptoms with um, more limited risks coming into the game. Okay, thanks, Dr. Hicks. I'm just gonna open the floor. Are there any other questions? I think we've got time for one more question. Let's see here. Okay. Oh, interesting question. I have a person asking, I had asthma as a child and as an adult, it seemed to go away. I'm a former smoker. When I stopped smoking, I started noticing more asthma symptoms. Is that because of the smoking or did it just make my symptoms worse even though I quit? Ooh, you're running into shaky territory for me because I'm a kid doctor. Um, <laughs> what I'd say is that um, for kids with asthma, um, some kids go through that trajectory where their asthma is really terrible when they're young and they slowly outgrow those symptoms. What I find when I look at older kids who outgrew their asthma, some of them really truly outgrew their asthma and they have amazing lung function. And other ones have some mild asthma symptoms, but it's sort of buried because they're no longer running when they play 
or stuff like, like bigger kids modify what they do a little bit or they have interests that really don't show the asthma the same way and they're less triggered by viral infections. I have noticed that people who are smoking, um, smoking comes with a whole host of side effects and symptoms all of its own. And sometimes the asthma gets buried. So you may have still had some mild asthma in there, but the effects of the smoking and the cough associated with the smoking and things like that, and the mucus production and poor lung clearance and things may really have hidden the asthma. And then as your lungs are feeling better again, they're like, oh, guess what? You still have it. Um, but yeah, I don't know the answer to that for sure. The other thing is that through your lifespan, your asthma can wax and wane. So it'll be maybe worse in childhood, better for a while as a teen or worse as a teen sometimes. And that gets better a bit. And then it'll get worse um, when you in your early 20s and stuff like that. So it could also be that you've had a little bit of asthma the whole time with kind of a waxing and waning severity. Okay, excellent. I think that's all the questions we have. Uh, so just take a moment to thank Dr. Hicks for joining us this evening, as well as all our, our patients attending through Facebook. Just a reminder to everyone, we are going to be doing a summer hiatus for July and August. We'll still be doing a few posts, but irregularly. If you have any follow-up questions, please let me know or let Johnny know. And we'll, we'll contact Dr. Hicks to see if we can answer your questions. And with that said, have a good night, everyone. Thank you again, Dr. Hicks. Thank you so much for having me. Um, yeah, and have a great summer, everyone, and hopefully an asthma-free summer.